Good morning. I'm Jillian Westerfield. I'm the associate minister here at Lake Street Church, and I'm so happy to see you all here, both in person and online. Uh, welcome back for Easter week two. I have one announcement. Um, it is related to the information in your bulletin about talking with friends about Lake Street Church, which will take place next Sunday, April 14th at noon in the dining room. There will be a free lunch. Um, the Outreach Committee is hosting this, and it's gonna focus on how to talk with others about Lake Street Church. This is a very important topic for us. Without growth in membership, we're not gonna be able to do as much as we hope to do here. So I really hope that you will show up for that and learn something from some of your friends here at Lake Street who are really good at talking to people about church. I also want to call your attention to the back of your bulletin where we have our native lands and reparations acknowledgement. Um, this is an aid to your worship. It's something I think it's important to reflect on, to think about where we've been and where we want to go and how we're going to get there. Please rise in body or spirit. In the shadow of empire, we make shelter together. We make space for righteous anger. Like the disciples huddled together, we find our courage together.
First ancient witness reading, Acts 4, 32 to 35. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Blessed be. Christ is risen, Lord of all creation. He has shown pity on all people. whether you're in person or online. This is a moment to think about um, today's ancient witness readings, the first one and the second one that we haven't heard yet. 
let me know how you feel about the story, any questions you have, things you would do differently, why you think this reading matters or maybe doesn't matter. And like I said, I invite you to either uh, raise your hand and the ushers will come around, or if you're online, you can type it in the chat. What a different world we'd live in if we lived like this. And I think it's aspirational. I, you know, I don't think we're going to ever get to that. But um, yeah, we should, we should do that every you know, 70 years. Everything goes back to everybody owning everything. Who was Thomas's twin? All right, those were powerful wonderings today. Georgia, I had never thought to wonder that. That was a really good wondering, thank you. <laughs> I'm so proud of you for speaking up. Um, at this time, I'm gonna invite our children who are fifth grade and younger to head to their classrooms to continue their worship there. And I also want to draw your attention to the reflection question, which I'll be using in my sermon. So go ahead and be thinking about what do you need to see to believe? What can you believe without seeing? When it was evening on that day, oh, sorry, second ancient witness reading, John 20, 19 to 30. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of persecution, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed him them his hands and his side and the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who is called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands, and I put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them, and the doors were shut. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. 
Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Blessed be. So if you've heard me preach before, you might know that John is not my favorite gospel. Um, I always prefer Mark. It's earthy, it's human, it really speaks to me. And this lectionary year is mostly based on Mark. So I was kind of bummed when I realized since it's, you know, the week after Easter that this was going to be a John week. And at first I was going to ignore it because I really like the Acts story. Um, I could talk all day about that. But wanting to ignore a passage is usually, for me, a good sign that I should face it. So here we are, talking through a messy story from John, because our community doesn't hide from doing hard things or asking tough questions, right? The first thing I want to address is that I made a tiny change to the reading. I usually leave any sort of ugly or ambiguous or confusing language and wait to address it in the sermon, but this is something in particular that's been a part of a long cycle of violence that I didn't want to be a part of. So I made a change that I think more accurately reflects the spirit, if not the letter of the passage. It usually reads that the disciples had locked themselves in a room to hide from the Jews. And that kind of language has been confusing and misleading and has contributed to a shameful legacy of anti-Semitism in Christianity. Jesus was a Jew. Most of his disciples and early Christians were Jews. They mostly functioned within a Jewish society under the control of the Roman Empire. So the power dynamics that were in place do not align with our modern language. That's why I changed it to say that they were hiding from persecution, because if you're otherwise unfamiliar with this passage and were to read it on your own sometimes, I don't want you to be caught off guard or surprised by those words. So I just wanted to call your attention to that. So with that out of the way, here's what's happening in the story. Jesus had died for a few days, three, and then came back. If you were here last week, Reverend Wolf talked about Jesus' new luminous body and I really like that, so I'm going to use that language too. Jesus is the same, but he's different. He overcame death, but he still carries the marks of the wounds. People who knew him well don't recognize him right away. And here we learn that he can appear in a locked room without opening a door, but is also solid enough to touch. A couple of his very closest friends, Mary, Mary Magdalene, Peter, and a beloved disciple whose identity is open to some interpretation, were at the tomb and were the first to know he was back. Most of his other close followers were hiding in this room together, terrified and trying to figure out what comes next. I have to imagine that most of us have had moments like that. Times when something world-ending has happened and we gather with our closest, most trusted people to grieve and try to make a plan. The loss of a family matriarch, a natural disaster, a surprise layoff, a worldwide pandemic, the times when nothing that we knew before makes any sense now. I want you to take a second and picture some of those faces that you gathered to you at those times. Maybe you couldn't be in a room together, but you reached out for that phone or computer so that you could draw together any way that you could. Think about how those people make you feel, what they have done for you, what you would do for them. Now imagine that your people are gathered, but you have to step out for a bit, because even in a crisis, we have to run errands sometimes. You get back and everything's different. People are saying things that make no sense. The bad thing didn't really happen at all. 
You saw it with your own eyes. You know it happened. But they're all, I don't know, the passage doesn't say exactly, but maybe laughing, happy crying, celebrating. I would probably think that the stress broke them, that they had some kind of collective hallucination that I missed out on. So now I'm not just dealing with the horrible thing that definitely happened. I'm losing my community too. Instead of sharing the burden with them, now I have to figure out by myself how I'm going to help them and carry them through the crisis, because I guess they can't handle it as well as I did. I think I'm probably not alone here in identifying with Thomas in this story. Physical, bodily, literal resurrection is a hard thing to believe, even in a time and place where maybe you had heard about it happening once in a while. It's even stranger that a resurrected person would be both corporeal and able to appear and disappear like a spirit. It's hard to believe. It seems like a trick. Many humans are skeptical by nature, and that was probably always true. So I'm sympathetic to Thomas, especially since he missed out on the original revelation to his friends. I think it was a kind and human and compassionate thing for Jesus to come to Thomas and share his wounds with him. I did also always think it was maybe a little mean or snarky of Jesus to criticize Thomas for not believing without that, because everybody else got the benefit of that. So I'm going to take a moment here and see what we either can believe without seeing or need to see to believe. One says, I have to believe that the God spark is present in everyone. Another says, if things are right, then I believe. Another says, I need to see a change in me to believe. But also, I can believe in love. Blessed be. So in the passage from Acts this morning, we hear about the first Christian communities holding everything in common. And to be really clear, they do mean material wealth and possessions. It's not exactly the same as our um, sort of modern concept of communism because it's not a government system. It's something self-imposed by a group, but it's not a metaphor, or at least it's not just a metaphor. I think that if you're living that closely in community, sharing the wealth so that no one is needy or has more than they need, you must be sharing your spiritual and emotional wealth too. Something I personally value about that kind of community is that it's okay to share your wounds. Your vulnerability can be a kind of wealth too, in a way that we can nourish people by sharing from our own stories. And I thought it was unkind of Jesus to withhold some of that from Thomas, just because he happened to miss the initial gathering. But then I came across a commentary by Reverend M. Jade Barclay, in which they write, you do not owe anyone access to your trauma because you hope for their solidarity. Even Jesus was choosy about with whom he shared the details of his body's memories. And this is what makes the story of Doubting Thomas so tricky for me this time around. Because even in really beautiful, loving, caring communities where we long for a peaceful and just world and strive to do what we can to bring it about, we can be guilty of demanding some kind of trauma payment in exchange for solidarity. Giving people space to share their stories can be a gift, and nothing can move someone to action like hearing a personal testimony. That's honestly kind of why we're all here in one way or another. But when that shifts from an invitation to an expectation, something is wrong. Some scars are more visible than others, but even when a scar is plainly visible, it doesn't give us permission to touch it or even to ask. Jesus plainly loves Thomas very much, so much that he's willing to share his wounds with him, even when it seems he might prefer not to. But it would have been nice if Thomas had been able to trust Jesus a little more, if he had listened to the words of the other people in his community and maybe moved on to the work that Jesus had called them to, instead of demanding more proof. 
to hear the story himself and probe the wounds. How much better could that moment with his friend have been? It sounds like what may have been one of his final interactions with Jesus was essentially, I love you, but you disappoint me a little. Because trust and dignity are also spiritual and emotional resources, a healthy community should provide each other. We have to honor each other's no's as much as the yeses. If we are modeling ourselves on a group where everything is held in common, we cannot ask anyone to give more than they have. There are a lot of big, horrific things happening in the world. War, famine, genocide, environmental collapse, human rights abuses at home and abroad. Telling and hearing the stories can be cathartic, and listening to what others tell us they need can help us figure out how to take action or what actions not to take. But when the story is no longer being offered freely, it stops being a resource and becomes a drain on resources instead. Eastertide is a time for renewal, resurrection, recreation, a time when the world is turned upside down in the best possible way, when anything is possible. Today's story calls us to make the most of that to not waste precious time demanding more proof of what we already know in our hearts is true, to not ask more, people, more of people than they can or should give. It calls us to be generous with our trust and bold with our forgiveness. Let's get out there this week and see what we can do together when we do all that. Blessed be.
I'm excited to kick us off with a prayer of thanksgiving. Um, Miriam has a new granddaughter. Her name is Miller Kate. <laughs> Gracious God. A prayer for my nephew Christian, who is being divorced, is in a dark place. Loving God. A prayer of gratitude for those who do what we ask, even when they don't want to. <laughs> Gracious God. Prayers that everyone keep their vision safe during tomorrow's solar eclipse. Use appropriate glasses only. Protect the children. <laughs> Loving God. Prayers for the family of our friend, Reverend Dr. Wesley White, who died unexpectedly this week. Loving God. Prayers for Andre, who passed away alone from a heart attack last week. Loving God. Prayer. Prayers of healing for Paige Temple following surgery and for Marsha Heater, who is recovering from COVID. Loving God. Prayer. A prayer of gratitude for this spiritual community. It is a safe, loving, and kind place. Gracious God. A prayer of gratitude from Karen Kidd for time with my mom, Ollie Johnson. Hey, Mrs. Johnson. <laughs> Gracious God. And I have a prayer of healing and hope for Sandra as she deals with cancer. Loving God. Holy One, we lift up these prayers and all those spoken and unspoken. We pray that you will bring us the grace and healing and comfort and joy that we crave. May it be as close as our next breath. In your loving name, amen. I invite us now to the offering. Um, in our most vulnerable moments, spiritually, materially, relationally, Jesus manifests in community embrace, in shared food and listening ears, in acts of solidarity and moral witness. Let us bring our offerings together so that we may meet and be met by the living body. Amen.
And at this table, our bodies and our senses are reminded that we are eternally embedded in this one in whom we live and move and have our being. We are always living in union with the divine, but we are often so busy, so preoccupied, so filled with judgments and expectations that we forget that life itself is communion with the divine. Jesus provides for us a living reminder that God is in all and all are in God. Through the Holy One, we are eternally connected throughout space and time in union with all things. This is why our invitation to this table is utterly simple. You are welcome just as you are. There are no conditions or requirements. All are welcome. And on the night Jesus was crucified, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it, saying, Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, blessed it, and said, Do this in remembrance of me. As often as you eat and drink, which is every day, remember me. Remember what I taught. Remember what I stood for. Remember my path of love. Remember me.
Call to Commitment by M. J. Jade Kaiser and Fleshed. Resurrection has come by way of fellowship. Those among us whom the empire treated as dead, those who lived amongst the tombs, we have reached out to each other and found our roots beneath the soil. So our roots protrude from the earth, passing valuable resources from one to another until no one knows who it came from. We live by way of fellowship, the light by which water and gas conceive sugar in plants. Our love is photosynthetic in the way that yes, we were buried, but the ground has no choice but to release us by touching one another, including the scars and the wounds. We can believe in one another, and we can be free. Blessed be. Thank you. 